Okay. Yep, there we go. All right, we're going to talk about some some individual angels uh, today. Who can name some angels from the Bible? Gabriel, Michael, two most popular. Uh huh. What else? Who else do we have? Think about who else is an angel. Angel of the Lord. Very good. Who else? Death angel. Death angel. Who who's the who's the father of death then? Satan, okay, yeah, so we'll go with that, right? Yeah, so we have Satan, right? We also have a guy named Abaddon or Apollyon. Do you remember hearing his name? Where's that from? Anybody know what book that's from? Yeah, Book of Revelation, right? That's where he's mentioned. So these are these are five that we're gonna that we're gonna go over. We're gonna talk about Michael first and then Gabriel. So you can see the list. All right, so next to Gabriel and Satan, Michael, he's probably the most famous angel in the, in the Bible. He's become a legendary character, right? Even, the, even people that don't go to church, aren't saved, right? They know about Michael, the archangel, right? Movies, all types of stuff. So he's often uh, hard to discern whether what we've learned about Michael, is it from the Bible or is it from, from the world, right? Because there's so many stories or whatever. Right, yeah, so, yeah, so, so people in the world, <clears throat> they've heard of Michael the Archangel. He's the only one identified as an Archangel. I did not know that. Did you guys know that? Yeah, Michael is the only one that's identified as an Archangel. Everybody, who else do they usually call Archangel? Gabriel, right? A lot of people will think that Gabriel's an Archangel, but the Bible actually doesn't tell us that. Yeah, so, I, I've, I've I just always thought, I thought that as well when I, uh... <clears throat> that's correct. And we're going to, so what, what are you, you going to start getting ahead on the program now? Like, huh? It's a, is that your new role now? <laughs> You're right, though. He is. He is. And we're going to, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Yeah, that's, that's his uh, big role for him, right? He's an archangel, but what does that mean? What's he accomplished? What are his responsibilities? How does he fit into God's heavenly host? Somebody want to read this for us? Somebody? Somebody? Thank you. But Michael the Archangel, when he displayed, disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce, pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yeah, so here we have Michael. Right? He's, he's disputing over the body of Moses for whatever reason. Um, so God's using him in this way uh, as, as a powerful angel, right? He's, he's disputing, so he's in some type of engagement with, with, with Satan himself, right? And then he uses, he tells Satan, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael's, Michael's a guy that he, he gets right in the mix of things. God, God uses him that way, right? The Greek word for archangel however that is, it means chief angel or chief messenger. The word archangel isn't used, <clears throat> isn't used to describe him in the Old Testament, but another angel calls him one of the chief princes. Sorry, my voice is giving out today a little bit. Um, so he's not, in the, in the, in the uh, Old Testament, he's not described as an archangel, but he is described in Daniel 10.13, if we want to turn to here, as a chief prince. Anybody want to read this for me? The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. Okay, so it says, one of the chief princes. So what does that indicate? More than one. Yeah, more than one, right? Because he's just one of the chief princes. Calling Michael one of the chief princes implies that Michael has peers. However, if there are any other archangels, the Bible doesn't really tell us who they are, right? So the Bible doesn't, doesn't mention any other angels specifically that are archangels. Here we go. Stands, he stands guard over Israel. So this is one of his, his primary things. 
In Daniel's last vision, an angel described how the last days will play out for the Jews. All right, who wants to read Daniel 12? At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been seen. There was a nation until that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except these, or against these except Michael, your prince. All right, so there we go, right? It's very clear. Michael has special responsibilities for Israel, right? He's to protect Israel, help in any way. He's a fighter. Jude 9 mentions that Michael argues with Satan about the body of Moses, right? Talked about that. Oop. I don't know how that got in there twice. He's a military commander. In Revelation, John sees a great war in heaven, Michael and his angels versus the dragon, who is Satan, and his angels. The devil and his forces are too weak to remain in heaven, however, and so they are all thrown down to earth. Revelation 12, 7 and 8. Somebody read that for me. Now war arose in now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Yeah, so here again we see we see Michael in the book of Revelation. So we see him in the Old Testament, we see him in the New Testament. Right? So he's throughout scripture, and here he is again. War arising in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against Satan. And Michael Michael is commanding the army, right? The army of the angels. So he's obviously, I guess he's like the general. Right? Anybody else have anything to say about Michael? Do you guys, any interesting facts that we may have missed or anything? No? All right. Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. So, so if you, I don't know if you said this already, but if he's the arch angle, angle, angel, that means he is the greatest angel. Isn't that the idea of archangel, arc? Isn't that like the top angel? Yeah, I would, I would think that so. Means? And, that's, and that's probably why he's the only one that's Right, he has no peers because he the, is the as, top. Right, as yeah. archangel. Now, interestingly, I didn't put it in the slides. Interestingly enough, in the, in the book of Enoch, which obviously is not part of the canon of scripture, but a historical document, I mean, a lot of people put, you know, a lot, of, a lot of value on that book. It's mentioned in Jude, right? Enoch's mentioned in Jude. In that book, Gabriel is referred to as an archangel. But, again, it's not part of the Bible exactly. But, yeah, so I would, I mean, I'm going to go with what the Bible actually says. Michael's an archangel. Probably means top guy, I would think. But Gabriel... We're going to find out here in just a minute where, where he's at, right? So Angel Gabriel, he's called the Mighty One of God. He, must be, he might be one of the most, most well-known characters in the traditional Christmas story. He's probably one of the most famous beings in the Bible. People often refer to him as an archangel. Again, it doesn't identify him that way in the Bible. Gabriel is used to speak to people, right? He's a messenger. He speaks with three Bible characters. Obviously, one of them is Daniel. Who, who knows the other two? Mary. Yep, Mary's one of them, obviously. Well, yeah, I guess Joseph. But there's another guy I'm, I'm thinking of in particular. Begins with a Z. Zechariah, yeah. All right, Daniel 8, 15 to 17. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near me where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. 
So here he is delivering a message to Daniel, right? And what is what is his appearance like? Right? So he's like a man, right? So he, he comes he comes to Daniel. Dan what's Daniel's reaction? We find this is usually common, right? When people see angels. He's frightened, right? Yeah, he's frightened, he fell on his face. So it must be a it must be an awesome sight. So he delivers two messages in the book of Luke. Saw that he just talked to Daniel. Now he's, we're going to the book of Luke, New Testament. One to Zechariah, another to Mary. And they're both concerning miraculous births. Who wants to read this for me? And there appeared to him an angel, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Lord. Standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. <clears throat> and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. <clears throat> and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord's a people prepared. More? <clears throat> And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. All right, so there we go. I know it's kind of a long verse there to get to the point that it's, it's Gabriel, right? He says, he introduces himself, I'm Gabriel. Where, where's Gabriel at? Yeah, he stands in the presence of God. So even though we're thinking Michael, right, the archangel, right, it's not like Gabriel has some type of low position, right? I mean, he's standing right in the presence of God, he says. He's delivering messages. God uses them to, uh, to bring forth news. Luke 1, 26 to 31. So we just read about him bringing news about who being born john right john the baptist so we'll go on to this familiar story anybody want to read for me no okay i'll read it in the sixth month the angel gabriel was sent from god to a city of galilee named nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man who was named was joseph of the house of david and the virgin's name was mary and he came to her and he said greetings O favored one the lord is with you but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So, pretty important message, right? Pretty important message. We should all get excited about that, right? We read the Christmas story, and I know sometimes it gets kind of all right, it's the Christmas, but really, right? That's what great joy for us. Gabriel's bringing, uh, bringing news that our Savior would be born. So he's used for, for big news bringing. Okay. Now we're getting to this guy, right? We covered the good angels, two, two of the really good angels, right? And uh, yeah, but now we got this guy here. Lucifer is one of God's angels. When the Lord gives some, someone or something a name, it has a meaning. The name of Lucifer means day star or son of the morning, which describes his intended role. However, his new name is Satan, which means adversary, because he became the enemy of God and all his people when he defied God. He also has many other names, the devil, the great dragon, Beelzebub, the serpent, father of lies, the evil one. And he's described as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Yeah, so he's got a lot of different names, none of them good. Started out that way though, right? He wasn't, he wasn't created for what he's doing now, right? 
I mean, Morning Star certainly doesn't doesn't seem like a too bad of a title. What happened? What did he do? Right? He, I am, right? Yes. I will statements. Revealing Satan's pride and arrogance and his desire to sit on a throne higher than God. Okay, somebody read this for me, please. I'll do it. I'll do it. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Here we go. Lucifer's sin got him thrown out of heaven. Now, Lucifer's, I will, I will, I will. Do we ever do that? Maybe not say that I will ascend, you know, above the throne of God, and I'll be like the most high, but do we ever put I in front of right, what we should be doing? But we, we do our stuff, right? So we have pride, we have arrogance, right? So it's really easy to point the finger at Satan. Obviously, he's the one that started all this, but yeah, we do the same stuff, really, in a, in a whatever way, you know. Just but we we put our we put ourselves first and before things that maybe God is calling us to do, right? Because we want to, we're selfish. There's a multitude of reasons. All right, it goes on in Ezekiel 28 to describe him. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So see how he's being described. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafting the gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. That's not normally how we picture Satan, huh? Or how the world pictures Satan. Because a lot of them, I don't think, understand how he, what he was actually made for. And his beauty, and right? But it overtook him, and now he's, you know, look, he was an anointed guardian cherub. He wasn't created to, to be evil, but he made that choice. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, and I cast you to the ground. Yeah, so where's Satan now? Yeah, right? You cast him down to the earth. He goes around as what? As a roaring lion, right? We, he was described like that as one of his names earlier, right? He goes around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he can hang out with. No, he looking for somebody to pet him. Is that what? No, no, it's for his, so he can right to devour. Yeah, to devour. He's about destruction. He was the model of perfection. He's full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. He was in Eden, the Garden of God with clothing adorned with precious stones, all beautifully crafted specifically for him and set in the finest gold. He was ordained and anointed by God as the mighty heavenly angelic guardian. He had access to the mountain of God. He was blameless in everything he did from the day he was created until the day that unrighteousness was found in him. His heart was proud because of his beauty and he corrupted his wisdom for the sake of his splendor. So he had all this, but he got too full of pride. 
All right. Oh, here we go. We don't like this. What does Satan do there? Blinds unbelievers, doesn't he? Yeah, until God opens our eyes, removes the scales from our eyes, right? We walk in blindness, and, and most of the world does today, don't they? The world is full of unbelievers. Who causes that? Satan, right? He's, he's part of this. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Right? That can be overcome, though, can it? Right? We're all testaments to that. We were all lost at one time. Right? So we keep praying, right? Praying for our loved ones. Pray for people you don't know. Right? I find myself doing that. I, I'm sure you guys do too. I'll be maybe at an event or something. And I just I just pray. I, and I ask God, I don't know. There could be 20 people there. And I just I ask God, open the eyes of the people that are in this room that their eyes need to be opened. Right? I mean, we need to be doing that. And then obviously sharing the gospel and, and all those things, you know. So people's eyes are going to obviously can be opened. You know, we just keep, keep praying for people. We don't know God's timing when they're, going to, when they're going to do that. I always think of Larry Webster. I'm sure some of you have heard the story how he prayed for his brother for 40 years. 40 years he was, he was faithful in praying for his brother's salvation. And that's what it took. 40 years and then God opened his brother's eyes and, and so Satan is overcome by that stuff so how are we supposed to respond to him yeah right there be sober minded be watchful right so we have to like be on alert right you got to be clear thinking you got to discern the situations that you're in Right? How he may be coming against you. I'm sure we all do this, right? Sometimes you're you're somewhere and you, you know, or you're you're in a situation or you're maybe getting ready to sin. And you gotta think about, oh man, I could be sober. I'm getting attacked right now. I'm getting spiritually attacked. Right? Because it's all around us. Spiritual warfare is all around us. And just because we're Christians, does that mean we're not gonna Right? It means they're still going to be attacked, right? Even sometimes more heavily, right? Don't we know that happens to a lot of times when people become Christians? Have we seen that? They become a Christian, and then all of a sudden they seem to get, get attacked, right? Satan seems to ramp up the spiritual warfare on somebody that's a new believer. Maybe to make them doubt the decision that they've made, right? Uh, or discourage them. Right? And I'm sure it's happened to all of us. Again, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Not a good scene. This is what we have to remember. Who can read that for me? And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where also the beast and the false prophets were, and they will be tormented for day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20.10. Amen. Right? So he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour, and he's successful. But does that mean we're defeated? No, of course not, right? Jesus has already won. And this is where the devil is going. This is his end he knows it. He knows it's coming soon. Him and his evil, false trinity, right? He tries to imitate God. So he sets up this false, this false trinity with him and the false prophet and the beast. And they go into the lake of fire and brimstone. So he's defeated. He knows where he's going. And he's tormented day and night for a little while forever right just like we're going to be in eternity with god forever can't wrap your mind around that well this is where he's going to be all three of them right 
forever and ever, all of eternity. This is one of his minions. This guy here, we don't really hear much about, about him, but plays an important role in the book of Revelation. So just like we were talking about ranks of angels, we have the Archangel Michael, you know, and we went over last week, you know, cherubs and seraphim and, right? So there's different, there's different ranks. Well, we're to presume that the ranks are the same way as the loyal angels. <clears throat> Revelation 9, 11, we learn about this other high ranking fallen angel. Somebody read that for me. All right. I'll do it. Lynn, you want to read it? Okay. <laughs> you waited until I was all the way over on the other side. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. That's what I do on Tuesday. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. Yeah, so there we see in Revelation. We talked about this. Remember the, the locusts that come out? Well, the appearance of locusts. I mean, they're demons, and they go around to demonic army, right? What's it say? For five months, they're they're going out, and and death escaped people. You couldn't die, but these these things attacked. Okay, so all this stuff is kind of kind of scary, you know, in a way. But you gotta remember, we're not doing this. We're not there for this part anyway. But we never want anybody in our lives that we know to go through this, because these people can't kill themselves. Right. It's for says, five death, months, death will they're going to be them. tormented, but they cannot kill themselves. And also, I want to mention that, you know, I know we have, we win at the end, but we also win right now because of Ephesians uh, 6. You know, we have the full armor of God to put on, and we have the shield of faith, and we have ways of dealing with the fiery darts from the devil. It's a battle in our mind. And, you know, those nights when you're lonely or whatever, and all those thoughts come into your mind, you got to combat it with the Word of God. That's our, that's our, uh, you know, our sword of the spirit. That's what we use to combat them. Yeah. It's all in the mind. Yep. You know, he can't, he can't hurt us anymore, but he can, you know, put terrible thoughts in our minds. Yeah. You know? obviously so, going to try to influence us. Yes, but yes. Like that's, that's the exact point. Ephesians 6, it's a spiritual battle. And it's not just against some believers, it's against us in a big way. Right? We're constantly going to be battling uh, in that way. Yes, Barbara? I think the evidence that this is going to happen very soon is what's going on in Israel right now. And God will not allow Israel to be defeated. Israel will come out triumphant, no matter how bad it looks. And so I think this is all imminent that we're studying today. I would agree. I would agree. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. And so, I mean, speak like in the spiritual realm, if you think about that, like, uh, not too long ago, I think Israel had something like 300 rockets shot at them all at one time, and I think like one or two kind of got through, right? And they were like, how is this? I mean, they have a, that Iron Dome, but, you know, I mean, did Michael have part of defending Israel in that in that situation? I mean, it certainly seems like it from what we read, right? He's, he's you know, so who knows what was going on in the spiritual, but God's in control. You know, so he, he does all this, and uh, yeah, it's a good point. We, we are victorious now as believers, right? But we still battle. But in the end times, during the tribulation, this is what's going to happen. Satan's going to have been given, you know, rule of the earth, um, and he has this guy, Abaddon in the Greek, Apollyon uh, is his name. Both names mean destroyer. He's the angel of the bottomless pit. And he's the king of the demonic locusts. So that's enough about that guy. Angel of the Lord. In the Old Testament, there's an angel that appears from time to time who seems to be different from all the other angels. The name given to this angel is the angel of the Lord. 
He speaks as God, identifies himself with God, and claims to exercise the prerogatives of God. The Old Testament angel of the Lord is the manifestation of God. Genesis 22, 11 and 12. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him for now. <clears throat> for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father and the law, Jethro the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. So we see here the angel of the Lord is being identified. We know that who spoke to, from the burning bush? It was God, right? Yeah. Many people believe the angel to be the pre-incarnate Christ, an appearance of the second person of the Trinity long before he became flesh in Bethlehem. Another reason for identifying the angel of the Lord with Jesus Christ is that after his birth in Bethlehem, the appearances of the angel of the Lord cease. So, so what do you think of that? Anybody have any thoughts on that? The angel of the Lord, pre-incarnate Christ? I don't really know much of you know, honestly, I don't really know much about about that. I kind of heard that before, but I think there might be some other viewpoints. I don't know. Does anybody else have anything about that or is this kind of consistent with what everybody's to Joshua? I mean there's there's several appearances. I just yeah. and he said, I am the angel of the Lord and then, you know, Joshua fell down and worshipped him. Right. I, I, a real angel will never let a person worship them. But the God, if he's God, yes. Yes, you're going to worship so, them, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that was actually the last, that was the last, one. The last slide. Um, and I think it might be, yeah, just pretty much right in time because we only have a few minutes left. So I think that's going to conclude our study on angels. Does anybody have any comments? Did you enjoy the study of angels? Yeah? Okay. I I have no idea what we're going to go into. Yeah. Wait, well, you see that all the time. Yeah, oh, another. Yes. So-and-so passed away, and they've, they've gotten their wings, right, and their halo and their harp, right? And it's, it's hard because I see that stuff a lot of times, like on Facebook, social media, right? Somebody will lose something, and, you know, whoever, you know, passes away. They become an angel, and I, oh, it's so hard because <laughs> you almost you like you want to like uh, no, not really. But there's a time and place for everything, right? We got to kind of you know. But maybe maybe you'll get an opportunity to talk to somebody about that and, and say you know that's not really what happens. Oh, the concert. Oh, okay. Okay, that's right. Yep, so see you for tickets for Carolina, and that's November 15th. Okay, and they're going to be here in the in East Hall, right? Okay, so tickets are still available for that concert. Do you want me to stop the recording? <laughs>